Welcome to Strides Forward, where we share stories about running told by women. I am Sheree Louise Turner. I am the host and producer of Strides Forward. And before we get into this story, I wanted to let you know that this episode is sponsored by The Feed, the number one online marketplace for nutrition and supplementation for athletes like you. The Feed was created by athletes for athletes, so these are all products that athletes use and they want to pass on all the great brands they've found to you. You've got over 250 brands to choose from and you'll find all your regular favorites here, Goo, Scratch Labs, Martin, as well as some brands that you probably aren't familiar with. And it's an opportunity to try something new because you know that it is past thoughtful scrutiny by athletes at The Feed. So order your nutrition and supplemental needs at The Feed today. And as a part of this sponsorship, you can claim $80 in feed credit today. Just go to thefeed.com forward slash forward. Yes, that's a forward slash and the word forward, F-O-R-W-A-R-D, to claim your $80 in feed credit today. And enjoy shopping at The Feed. Now, on to the episode. I consider myself an energetic person who loves the outdoors and I love a challenge. I love to have a goal. And I'm... Um, I got married, I did no sport, I had a baby at the age of 33, and by 34, I decided, uh, a friend of mine asked if I would like to try running, and I said, um, yeah, perhaps just maybe down the driveway, that seems quite far, about three cars long, <laughs> seemed like a long way to run, <laughs> but anyway, that started us off, and I found that we were chatting away wildly, and It became the beginning of a kind of a lifelong pathway for me. And um, now go straight to the end of my story. I've just signed up for my 31st Comrades Marathon. So that little jogging friendship started a huge pathway for my whole life. Hello there, my name is Pat Freeman. I am a 66-year-old. I've lived in Durban, South Africa, most of my life, and it happens to be the end of the Comrades Marathon on the down run, and on the up run, it is the start. So I've had Comrades Marathon in my life since I've been very young, and always thought this is the race where the men do strange things, and the men go out there like crazy and run 90 kilometers. But of course, that was a long time ago, and this is a podcast about women doing, well, sometimes strange things and always awesome things. You are indeed listening to Strides Forward, where we share stories about running told by women. I am Sheree Louise Turner, the host and producer of Strides Forward, and I am thrilled to share the story of, yes, how Pat Freeman went from being a non-runner and comrade spectator to completing this grueling race 30 times. Her story of fortitude and determination is the perfect way to celebrate the return of this, the oldest and largest ultra-distance road race in the world. Comrades will happen on August 28, 2022. It is the first time since 2019. If you have been with us since our launch just over two years ago, or you've listened through our back episodes, you will know that we focused many of our first stories on experiences at this truly incredible event. If you're not familiar with Comrades, well, the first thing I'd suggest is go back and listen to those early episodes. We go into lots of the fascinating details about Comrades, and we tell a lot of great stories about women runners at that event. For now, however, I will fill you in on some details to know for this episode. Comrades is a 90-kilometer or roughly 56-mile race that, as Pat pointed out, runs between her hometown of Durban, which is on the coast, to Peter Maritzburg, which is up in the hills. And each year, the race switches directions. Years when it finishes in Durban are called down years because there's more downhill than uphill. And the other years, not surprisingly, are called up years. And lest you think that going downhill is much easier than going uphill, I will let you know that pounding for miles downhill on pavement 
can ruin your legs. It is brutal. So you may have gravity on your side, but it does not make the race easier. In fact, a lot of Comrades runners will tell you they actually find the uprun less painful. But here's one fact. Whatever direction you run, Comrades, it is tough. There are virtually no significant flat sections on this course, and it is mostly exposed, which means you're probably out in the sun because even though it is run in South Africa's winter, it can still get quite warm. But what this race serves up in challenges and difficulty, it balances out in support and enthusiasm that I can only describe as magical. The crowds are spectacular, and for those who can't make it to the race in person, they can watch it live on TV for the entire 12 hours of the race. This race has a strong cutoff time at 12 0 0 0 one second later, and you are diverted off into an area that does not cross the finish line. It is brutal, it is sad, but it also makes finishing comrades very meaningful. To say that you're a comrades finisher, pretty much everybody in South Africa knows exactly what that means. Comrades Day is essentially an unofficial national holiday. It is a cultural touch point. And it has been for a long, long time. The race started in 1921, and it has happened every single year since, other than during wartime and during COVID. Like I said, this year marks the return after a hiatus since 2019. And of course, we could not be more excited. And sharing the story of a woman who has run this race almost more times than any other woman in history feels very fitting. Women were first allowed to run Comrades in 1975, and since then, only five women have run 30 or more times. This year, running her 31st Comrades, Pat will be an even more rare company. She'll be among the three women who have run Comrades more than 30 times. It is truly astonishing. Before we get into Pat's story, you'll need to know a few things. One, right off the bat, you'll notice that the word marathon is being used in more of a generic way to refer to just a very long race, as opposed to, of course, the standard marathon distance, which is 26.2 miles or 42.2 kilometers. Pat also mentions Park Run, which is a free weekly timed 5K that happens every Saturday morning. Park runs happen all over the world, and they are very popular in South Africa. Pat also mentions buses at Comrades. These are just pace groups. They are groups of runners who get together in Comrades who all have a similar goal for their finishing time, and they help pace each other and support each other along the way. There's usually a leader or two in there that will help everybody stay on track. There are, to be clear, no actual buses. Pat also mentions tables probably doesn't need much of any explanation, but these are aid stations. Aid stations are made up of many, many tables, and there are many, many aid stations throughout Comrades. One other thing to know about Comrades is that you have to qualify. You can't just sign up and run. You have to have run a standard 26.2-mile marathon within a qualifying time. It used to be under five hours, and now it is four hours and 50 minutes. Every single time you run Comrades, you have to have run a marathon first to qualify. And with all that, we now turn it over to Pat to let her tell her story of how she went from Comrades fan and non-runner to holding the unique distinction she has today of more finishes than just about any other woman in the very long history of this epic race. This achievement, I can tell you, was not something she ever planned for, especially given her early impressions of comrades. In my my sort of informative school years, we used to always be glued to the TV watching these men. And it's probably a, a, because of women only starting running in the late 70s or the mid 70s. 
And I'd already left school and used to drive my little Vespa scooter to the side of the road to watch these crazy men going by. And they were all so, so finished, so exhausted. And I thought, this is so crazy. Why on earth are they doing this? And then, you know, toddle off home till the next year and say, oh, here they come again. But there were only men doing it. And it was never even on my radar when I started running. You know, it was this driveway thing. And this friend of mine just helped me through some of the sort of probably baby blues. You know, I'd been home with the baby. My husband was a runner at that time. And I didn't do any running because the same thing, he fitted into that category where, where all the men go off and do these things. And I don't quite know what the women do. So my baby was born in 86. And it was in 87, I, I, this little lady ran past my gate while I was gardening one day. And I thought, look at that, a lady running, what on earth for? You know, she must have lost the dog or something. But anyway, she, she started chatting with me and I said, where are you going? Why? <laughs> and that's when, when she said I could run and we joked about the driveway and she took me with her and I, I was shattered. I said, but I, I can't do this. It's really hard, you know, and as most people will tell you, a little bit at a time, we did these bite-sized pieces. And I found that I was so happy. I was such a happier person. So we set a little 10K goal for that year. And that's that was in the 1987-88. So we did a 10K two years running. We aimed at the same race. And during that time, um, I'd had my baby. He was two. And I got divorced when he was three. So from from the age of four, say, onwards, um, until he was 13, I was a single mom with him. And my running was a huge, huge problem solver for me, hugely, especially when I first um, was on my own, when I was first divorced. I, I just didn't seem to have direction. I didn't know where I was going with my life, with my child, with my relationships. Everything was just a bit all over the place. And But when I went to run, I found little places to put everything. You know, I thought, oh, but I can see now. If I did this, this would be much better. And then that, and I'd work out all these things and sort them out and put them in their places and come back with somebody's plant from their garden that I'd found and it was a perfect treasure to grow at home. And, you know, I would just do what was in front of me. Slowly but surely, we went from one distance to the other and she kind of stopped at a marathon and I took one look at Two Oceans Marathon in Cape Town, South Africa, which is the most amazing race, the most beautiful race in our country. I, I give um, our races, our ultra marathons, I give them labels between Comrades and Two Oceans. And in my mind, Two Oceans is the most beautiful race in the world, never mind in our country. And I say Comrades is the most prestigious. It really is. It's such a special little animal of its own. And once you're hooked on it, you're just there for life, I'm afraid. Two Oceans is 56 Ks, and it's sort of made up of two parts. It goes from low level flat for half of the race till nearly halfway, and then two major mountain passes at the end of the race. So it's really quite a challenge. And once I'd finished Two Oceans, and I was still sort of alive, and I was walking around, and nothing bad had happened, and I thought, wow, that was so far. I loved the day, by the way. It was just so beautiful, looking at the mountains. It was so distracting from being running. I just loved the outdoors and this adventure, this goal that I was trying to achieve. And when I finished Oceans, I was just in awe of myself. I was so proud, and I thought, this is so far. I don't know how I managed that. And it was in the week or so after that I said, you know, this, this comrades thing is only like a few more Ks. It's not that much more. <laughs> and surely that's possible. Maybe I'll have to walk a bit, but surely that's possible. And I entered comrades in that same year. So the year I did my first ultra, which was two oceans in the end of May, <laughs> I did my first comrades the same year. And um, it was <laughs> quite something. I was fine until about 60 Ks, and then they put up this wall, you see, and I'm sure most runners know about the wall that they hit. And, um, oh, my goodness, <laughs> I, I cried and walked and cried and walked, and, and the people around me carried me. And, I mean, my finishing picture is a picture of me going, oh, woe is me, crying into my hand. I, I wasn't worried about the, the actual finish. I wasn't impressed by doing it. I was just shattered. I was so tired. I couldn't believe that it was so far and you had to keep going even when you when you couldn't run anymore. You still had to run. Um, so I was grateful to the guy that dragged me over the line and not that impressed, even less impressed when I, when I had to fetch my baby and I could hardly carry him. I was so tired. <laughs> um, that was just all a bit much for me. But 
within a week after that, I was so proud. I couldn't believe how many people were saying how well I'd done and they didn't know how I did it. And I, my, my chest just grew and I thought, oh, I can't believe it. I'm, I'm like famous. I finished this big race. And that was that. I was done. I was cooked. <laughs> I, had my, I had my target. But then people start waffling and saying, well, you know, you're not a real comrades runner if you don't do one up and one down. You've got to do both, otherwise you're not a real runner. And um, I sort of thought about it, but I thought, no, I don't know about that. I ran the down and in my opinion, down sounded like an easy way to go rather than up. So I was quite happy with my first choice. But the more people were saying, no, yeah, but you haven't gone up yet, so you're not a real runner. I thought, hmm, what a cheat, you know, don't challenge me. And um, we carried on training away, ended up doing another two oceans because my whole running club was doing two oceans. And that's why I ended up on number two. <laughs> but number two went so much better than number one. So number two, I thought, no, I'll, I'll just train a little bit harder. And I took like an hour off my time. And I thought, wow, I thought I was like quite the athlete, having done nothing my whole life, no sport. <laughs> Even though I enjoy outdoors, we just it, we weren't a family that had that in our lives. Um, we, we just managed to get to school and back and play a few social things, but no real sport in our lives. So maybe I had it in me, but um, at the time, there was nothing much. I used to run around the, the trees and the family neighborhood. I liked running, but it didn't mean anything great to me. I just enjoyed it. Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey, and we want to hear from you. The information in the survey will help us gather statistics and in turn make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads, but this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show. Every year that I went back was a different motivating factor, a different thing happening in my life. It wasn't that I intended doing so many. I was quite happy with my two, actually. Um, It was only when I did a bit better with my second one that my club was, like, proud of me. And then I got proud of me. And I'd never achieved much in academics or anything at school. And my family was always saying, well done. And I thought, oh, finally, I did something. Um, Perhaps I'll just go and do it again, and I'll be doubly you know, doubly proud of this achievement. So when it got to the third one, I was just involved with the club and we all ran together in groups and it wasn't a case of, um, are you doing comrades? You know, it's just this, why haven't you entered yet? You know, there wasn't, if you were a a person that ran a a company relay race and you lived in Durban and you said, "Um, yes, I'm a runner. And they would say, well, how many comrades have you done? And that really, (laughs) they just sort of expect that of every Durban runner. And once you're in the club, it's even more expected of you. And when I say expected, it's in a nice way. It's a lovely group that ends up traveling everywhere together, doing races together, trying to better their times by hanging on to a better runner. And those are all the things that they make lovely friendships with some people that you don't even know their name. I say, Mr. Red Shorts, here he is again. You know, just because you recognize the person's running style. So you make lifelong friends and I don't know how to put it, but the club was the biggest thing that dragged me through my first few comrades. So getting up to five was fairly easy. It was it was becoming okay. Um, I could I could do it with minimal training because during that time um, I just I couldn't hold down my full time job and do any rigorous training, gym work, anything else. So I was lucky enough to have my parents' uh, support system really near me, and um, they had my my son twice a week. And on those days, I would go straight from work and I would run with my club as much as I could for an hour or two, whatever the distance took. And they would feed him, bath him, and I'd quickly get back in time just to greet him before bed, take him home, and we would, you know, it would be bedtime already. So I had those two days and then one day on the weekend. And my whole comrade's career, um, I stuck to that regime and it works for me. <laughs> so I was lucky enough to have that support and have that that. Um, that hang in there factor. You know, in in my head, I was saying, I'm not going to fail. I don't care what it takes. If I can't run so much, I'll just run less. 
but I'll try harder and I'm, I don't want to fail. So I told my head that that's what we'd be, we'd be doing and that's how we moved forward. So since then, and that's still how I run to this day. I run twice a week. Uh, I have pushed out slightly, though. I broke loose and I'm doing a park run on a Saturday. So I do throw in a quick 5K. But sometimes I just walk that. But so to this day, I run two days a week and maybe a park run and then a longer run on a Sunday. And that's all my comrades comprises of, and it works for me. I don't say that would work for everybody, but it works for me because I get enough rest. I can still see my family. And then I rolled on. And then there were a few people in our club that achieved their green number. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that be good? So the green number is is quite prestigious. You don't have to run your comrades in succession, but you have to have completed 10 comrades marathons. Once you, um, when you first apply to, to run a comrades marathon, you are generated the next race number that comes up. Um, so you will get a number, and if you continue running, you will keep that number with you for every race that you continue to do. If you run 10 Comrades Marathons, then you will get that as your permanent number, and nobody else will ever be issued with that number. So that becomes your permanent green number. After 10, you get a little presentation at the finish. There's always a celebrity of some sort. Um, and when I say a celebrity, a running celebrity, <laughs> a past winner usually. Um, and they will be standing at the finish. And as you cross the line, um, you go through to a special little awards ceremony. And that person will be standing there and, and um, present you with your green number, which is an embroidered cloth green number with your, your running number on it and one laurel underneath that. And that laurel underneath your number means you've completed 10 marathons. Should you go on and do 20, you would still be keeping that same number. But then after the 20, um, you would be awarded another embroidered patch. And this one would have two laurels under it. So um, in 2019, I was lucky enough to get mine with my three laurels. When I got to my 10th comrades, I I actually met somebody. My son was 13 and I was about to run my 10th. And I met a guy that said, no, he wants to do comrades. He's always wanted to. And I thought, yeah, he's just chatting me up. This is not real. Anyway, he he put his head down and I I ended up marrying him. I married him before his first comrades and it happened to be my 10th. So my 10th one was quite fun. I tried to run with him, which didn't work very well because I was a bit faster and he he started getting slower near the end when I get faster. But um, we both finished and it was wonderful. And then he, he had the bug. So he had the, I've got to do one up and one down. You told me that. And I said, oh dear, but I was done now. I've done my 10th. And so so we did another one because he had to do one down and one up. And then he thought he could better his time. So that's how we went on until we got to about 15. And then he stopped. And I said, well, I'm just over 15. Not many women have got over, over 20. So let me go for 20. So that's how I bumbled on. But, you know, to try and motivate myself, I still did my minimum training. But I used to, I started running trail. And I love trail. That was part of the adventure in me. So I would pick a trail run out of the blue, uh, go and run it, a multi-day one or an ultra trail, and then just use that as my strength building. And so every year I would pick something different. I wouldn't do the same comrades training. I'd throw in something different, and then that would get me through another comrades. And then it would be, oh, it's June. Yes, off we go. We must do comrades. And it, it wasn't that... It was my goal. It was just part of how we live here in Durban because we are on one end of the race. And if you're a runner at a running club, you all appear to just get drawn into that. You really get caught up in it. So that's that's how I went to 20. Um, after that, I can't remember what the mistake was, <laughs> why I carried on. I, I think I still managed to do odd races. Um, I managed to travel overseas. So I was lucky enough to, my, to have a sister that lives in Switzerland So um, one of my first overseas races was the Luzanne Marathon. And the same thing, the races just came at the right time for a bit of a comrade's um, distance training. So I was lucky enough to every year be able to do something different. So I I have done a few overseas. My reputation uh, precedes me about diving into something that I don't know if I can really do, but it just looked like a good idea at the time. I'm known for that. And one of them was the Jungfrau Marathon. So I said to my sister, I've already done Lausanne. Let's find something else. And I just looked at a map. And the map said not far from where she lived, there seemed to be a big mountain called the Jungfrau. Um, And it's in Interlaken. And Interlaken's all flat. So off we went. We just entered it and off we went. 
Um, and it was fine until halfway. Oh, my goodness, it just went straight up, straight up that mountain. I didn't realize that was that, that mountain meant something like that. I thought we were running around the base. So it was a bit of a shock. But, um, yeah, I got there in the end. I, I'm very good at just bobbing and weaving and leaning with the punches. <laughs> so if it's going to be difficult, oh, well, it'll be a good experience. I think my character has probably got me this far with just my sense of adventure, sense of challenge, and sense of setting a goal and then not stopping until I get there. When you're doing the race, uh, you don't set out and say, whoa, there's my 90 Ks. Look at that. I'm going for 90, going for 90. You know, the whole race is broken up into so many little parts. That's how I do it, because the only way you can cope with such a big figure, especially when you're a run of the mill like me, I'm just a survivor runner. Um, so I break my race up all along the way. Um, I'm just going to this tree when it's a really a bad moment. But when I'm feeling a bit better, I'll run for a kilometer and then give myself a treat with food or, or the way I'm running or just my thought patterns. You've got to have a very strong head to do that. Okay, I've got a, a saying that somebody said to me once, and I thought that was quite nice. He said, um, now, please remember, when you go out there, he says, don't be in a hurry to get tired. And all it means is just go slower at the start. You know, there's a long day to get tired and don't rush it. You know, don't, don't do it all in the beginning of the day. Um, depending on which way you're going, whether you're coming from Maritzburg or Durban, both ways you've, you, you're hitting a bit of a hill straight up. Walk a bit of it. It's a big day and it's a long day. And you can make up that time that you walk right in the beginning far easier than when you've run out of steam and you're trying to walk. When you've run out of steam, it's too late to try and, you know, save something or have some more energy for the rest of the day. I, I don't run with a watch. Uh, I've, I've never got that part. Um, I often had a problem in that I uh, wear glasses and I never quite got the hang of contacts. So I couldn't really see the time anyway. So um, I just thought, oh, this is for the birds. I, I, I'm just going to have to try and do the best I can. And then I got into the hang of doing the best I could at all times. And my theory was that if I ran the best I could at all times, rested a little bit now and again, just when I had to, and did the best I could, what would the point be if I looked at my watch and it says, you go faster and I've got nothing left to give? How am I going to do that? So it was a very basic theory I had, but it works for me. And then I uh, have my theory about wasting little minutes here, there and everywhere. Um, you, you don't waste your time getting a massage. Rather just walk slower up a hill. At least you're moving forward. You must move forward at all times. Just keep moving forward. If your relatives are at the side of the road, tell them beforehand. Tell them I'm coming by. I expect to be within this hour. When I come, please walk up the hill with me with some tea. But walk with me. I'm not stopping. You know, and do those kind of little tricks. Uh, move forward at all times. Coming to tables, there are people everywhere. They just waste a lot of time. So run around the, the first bundle of people, because most people seem to rush up to the table and dive into the first table, whatever they can find on it. And because of the number of runners in the Comrades Marathon, the tables are spread over a wide area. So pick your table. You don't need the first table. Just go running past. You've now overtaken 30 people in one shot. And then go to the second table and pick up what you want and carry on running. Get out of the hubbub. Don't bob around where all the traffic is and all the people are. Get out of it and go and walk quietly on the hill with purpose. So walk as fast as you can and drink and eat what you have. So that time saved around every table when there's, oh, I don't know the number, but I'm sure it's, it's more than 60 tables. If you saved a minute on every one, oh my goodness, that's a lot of time. Um, yeah, just admire the view. Talk to the people around you. If there's a little bus going along um, and they, they're singing and it sounds good to you, hang in with them. Hang in for a few Ks. Hang in for the whole race. You know, you must be flexible on the day. In my mind, I, I must say I'm, I'm very aware that it's, it, I'm privileged to be living so close to a race like that that I can actually compete in it. I'm privileged I have two legs. I, I'm, I, I really do... Um, feel for people, uh, people that are underprivileged and people that are ill and um, deformed in any way and cannot take part. And I'm taking part and I'm complaining because I'm going up this hill. And I do use that a lot in my running. You know, when I, my mother-in-law, um, my new mother-in-law was in a wheelchair from 20. 
And I used that a lot. You know, I'd get to a place where I thought, you know, here I'm busy muttering and moaning and she would give anything to walk two steps. And here I'm moaning because I put myself in this position and now I'm saying, but now is enough. You know, I've now had enough of this. So I did, I did use that kind of um, support sort of, or what would I call it? Uh, it? I just feel for people like that. And that just made me stronger. It just made me say, yeah, I think I should be quiet and just count my blessings and keep moving. It'll come right later. And it does. It always comes right. Year after year, comrades run after comrades run. Pat kept moving, and it did always come right in the end. All the way to 2019, the last running of the Comrades Marathon, when she earned her third laurel. This signified, of course, that she had run this incredible, long, challenging, celebrated race 30 times. I mean, that is truly awesome. And with this huge achievement done, it did get Pat thinking about what the future might look like. I qualified for 2020 because I thought it would be nice to just do one more than the round amount. Um, so, because most people would stop on the round amount. But I, I wanted the 30 once I realized there was only a handful of women in that pocket. I thought that might be quite nice. And I managed to qualify and then COVID came. And, um, just before my 30th, I decided perhaps I wouldn't be going on after that. And if I didn't, what was I going to do on the day? Because um, I, don't, I just don't know how not to run. And I was lucky enough to be um, offered a position on the board at Comrades. And that, that I thought would be the help for me. I would throw myself into whatever I could give back in that way. I could join a few committees and assist wherever I could. And that would help me to wind down. And I'm quite involved in charities. I love I love charity work and on my on the board where I am um, each board member has to carry a portfolio and I carry the charities one so I'm the chairperson for the charities and we have six of them six official charities and each of them um, is trying to raise funds for their own cause by using comrades runners but then we have a comrades charity called the Amabidi Bidi charity that's registered and then under that fall the six charities so if somebody wants to donate money to Amabidi Bidi they do that and we then split it between all six and they sold those strings of beads that are sometimes on a runner around their neck and it, it was it was sold as the Amabidi project and it's a simple little thing and it's it's really the the beads that come from the valley of a thousand hills where they do the most amazing bead work. So to have a string of, of beads around your neck, that showed that you had Ubuntu, which is that you were you cared for others. And um, everybody used to run in them. So I'm trying to revive that a little bit this year. So, yes, not only does Pat continue to run Comrades, she's also found other ways to be involved in the race, including reviving beloved traditions. And this at a time when we're all overcoming the ravages of COVID, especially in South Africa, a place that was hit really hard by the pandemic, and promoting opportunities to demonstrate our shared compassion for those around us is something we certainly all could use a little more of. Now, whether or not Pat continues to run Comrades after number 31 is something only the future will reveal. But the one thing that is certain is that without having set out to make it so, the Comrades has become a defining element of Pat Freeman's life. Because it's not only about running. It became a structure that she could rely on to serve any number of purposes in her life, to get her through rough times as a single mom, as a way to bond in a new relationship with her now husband, as a goal that kept her fit and healthy year after year, as a confidence booster to rely on, as a launching pad to spur on other adventures and travel. And now as a way for Pat to give back through charity work and very certainly by inspiring others to go after big challenges fueled by desire and determination. Her wisdom and experience will no doubt serve those around her even after she decides not to toe the line, if that day should ever come. And all of this points to a steady truth about sports, especially when they become such a regular part of your life for such a long time. And that is that sports are about so much more than the activity itself. 
I want to thank Pat for sharing such a beautiful representation of how that can manifest. That does bring us to the end of Pat's story. And again, we want to thank her so much for sharing her running experience on the podcast. I also want to thank Deline Cools of the Comrades Organization for putting us in touch with Pat. Deline and her colleagues have been very supportive of the podcast, and I really appreciate their help and their support. And again, I am completely in awe of Pat's tenacity to enter this grueling event so many times. While I don't yet know what running this event is like even once, I am totally sure of one thing, and that is, it doesn't get easier. And even with all that knowledge about how tough it's going to be, she continued to send her entry in. I mean, just wow. I'm really looking forward to being out on the road at this year's Comrades and hopefully getting to high-five Pat once we've both crossed the finish line in Durban. I am very excited for her to get that just one more than a round number and be among the three women who've run Comrades the most in its history. I'm also excited that you're here listening to this episode. Thank you. I've said it before, and it's always true. We love making this podcast, but we could not do it without you. And we would love it if you would take just a minute to share the show on social media. Word of mouth is how independent shows like ours grow, so your sharing the show makes a huge impact. Thank you. And please tag us. We are at Strides Forward on Twitter and on Instagram, and you can find us on Facebook, too. And, of course, I do not make this show by myself. Cormac O'Regan makes all the original music for the show, and he does the sound design. He does that from his studio in Cork, Ireland. April Mariner of Bonfire Collaborative does all the design work for Strides Forward, the website, the merch, the social media, all of it. And April comes to you from Truckee, California. You can find her at bonfirecollaborative.com. And yes, I am Cherie Louise Turner, the host and producer of Strides Forward. And as always, I am coming to you from a closet in Somerville, Massachusetts. Thank you again for listening. And until next time, we wish you many healthy, joyful Strides Forward. Whoops, that strides forward. Forward. Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman.